I want to take up this morning the phrase, God works in mysterious ways. There's a lot of things that are commonly accepted sayings that get repeated and repeated. They become proverbs or they become cliches or Christianese that people use all the time. Some of these things don't have any biblical basis. And what's, what's fascinating is that these things will be in our frame of reference in our thinking uh, because we've heard them so many times and we, we accept them as true, but maybe they're not. So I want to look at this phrase and I want to see what Scripture has to say about it. And so the phrase again is, God moves in mysterious ways. I found an article on the web that described the phrase in the following way. God moves in a mysterious way, meaning the implication is that God's plan is beyond human understanding. God has a reason for everything, however strange it may be. In other words, the basic idea is everything that happens, God has a reason for. That's the what the saying is used to mean. This article further describes the phrase as follows. This saying is sometimes used to explain or at least justify unpleasant events. So the two things I want to take from this article is, is the following. One, The phrase is frequently used to justify or explain unpleasant events that happen on earth. And the second thing is the idea of the phrase is God has a reason for everything that happens. Get with me Deuteronomy chapter 22. Deuteronomy chapter 22. Deuteronomy chapter 22. It's more important to understand what Scripture says than it is to understand man's wisdom. Look with me at Deuteronomy 22, verse 6. If a bird's nest chance to be before thee in the way in any tree or on the ground, whether they be young ones or and so on. But do you see how it says chance? It doesn't say if a bird's nest is in a location because God foreordained that it would be there. If a bird's nest is in a location because God predestinated that a bird would build in that location and the bird would have the materials to build and hence it was God's intention before the world began that there be a bird's nest in that location. You see the point. It uses the word chance. God didn't purpose it to be there. He didn't intend for it to be there. It occurred there because God created birds. Birds have an understanding that causes them to build nests, and the bird chose to build a nest there. But it wasn't something that God foreordained. Look at 1 Samuel 6. 1 Samuel 6. First Samuel chapter 6, verse 9. Now in First Samuel 6, you may recall this, the ark of the Lord has been captured by the Philistines. And what happens is while the ark of the Lord is in the possession of the Philistines, they have all these problems that happen to them. Notice what verse 9 says. And see if it goeth up by the way of his own coast to Beth Shemesh, then he hath done us this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that smote us. It was a chance that happened to us. So let me give you the context just so you understand what's going on there. The Philistines defeat Israel and they capture the ark. And so they think they've won this victory. What God does is he allows them to possess the ark, but what they keep suffering is they keep suffering these maladies, these problems, while they're in possession of the ark. And so they're pondering what to do, and they decide, well, here's what we'll do. We'll put the ark 
on the back of this cart with oxen and we'll just let the oxen go wherever they go and what we'll do this is the Philistines of course if it if it returns back to Israel we'll know that God did this to us but if the oxen go another direction they'll know that it was a what a chance that happened to them now in this particular instance the ox take the ark of God back to Israel and so it wasn't a chance in this instance but notice the Bible describes it as a chance that in other words there are some things that happen just because they happen on the earth get with me Ecclesiastes chapter 9 Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 11 now you know that Ecclesiastes is written by the wisest man who ever lived. It's written by Solomon. Notice what happens in Ecclesiastes 9, verse 11. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to to men of skill. Notice what it says. But time and chance happeneth to them all. The simple fact of the matter is that in human affairs, one of the big factors that determines what happens on this earth is chance. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 11 says that. Time and chance happeneth to how many? to them all. Chance is just part of our existence here. Get Luke chapter 10. That doesn't mean that everything that happens is chance, but it does mean that you can't say that everything that happens is somehow something God foreordained or intended or caused to come about. Look at Luke chapter 10 verse 30. Luke chapter 10, verse 30. And Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Who's speaking in verse 30? Jesus Christ, obviously, right? You know that. It wasn't a really a trick question. And Jesus answering said. So this is clearly the words of the Lord. It, depending upon your Bible, these may be in red letters, so they're clearly the most important part of the Bible. Now, I say that joking, of course, because the entire Bible is God's word. But do notice in Luke 10, 30 and 31, it is the Lord that is speaking. When we were in 1 Samuel 6, it was the Philistines speaking. So do the Philistines always have all their doctrine right? Not always. But does Jesus Christ know what he's talking about? And, of course, the answer to that is yes. So Luke 10 Verse 30, and Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Verse 31, and by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. This is the parable of the Good Samaritan. And what's fascinating is the Lord Jesus Christ says that what happens is after this man is victimized, the folks that pass by, at least the first one, passes by according to what? Chance. God didn't foreordain it. He didn't predestinate it. What, what happened in that instance is that man was doing something based upon a decision. He decided he was going to travel that way at that particular time. He made a decision to do that. And it was by chance that he happened upon the, the individual that was, was there wounded. Look with me at 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 37, and of course, 1 Corinthians 15, we're reading something written by the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians 15, 37, And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain, it may chance of wheat 
or of some other grain. Now the, the point, you've seen this, we've, we've, we've shown you this multiple times now, chance is a Bible word. There are things that happen on this earth simply by chance. They're not predestinated, they're not foreordained, they just happen. Now if you re recall, the, the phrase God works in mysterious ways or God moves in mysterious ways, the common explanation of that is God has a reason for everything. Everything that happens in life, there's a reason for. Is that true? It's not true. It's not true based upon the testimony of Scripture. There are things that happen simply as a result of random chance. Okay? Look with me at Romans 1. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 10. And I want to show you some specific words that Paul uses. Romans 1, verse 10. Making request. Notice the next word. If, by any means, now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. That's a very interesting verse. The way a lot of people talk to today sometimes is they say, I'm going to do thus and so because God told me that this was going to happen. Right? And I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. What Paul says here, I mean, think about this. This is the apostle of the Gentiles. He was given the dispensation of grace. He was given the mystery. His job is to make all men see, according to Ephesians 3.9. It would be very reasonable for Paul to conclude, God wants me in Rome. Rome's the capital of the earth at that time. There's tons of Gentiles there. If you're going to reach the Gentiles of the world, you're going to need to do, do so through Rome. And Paul doesn't say, I'm going to be in Rome because God wants me there and I know it'll happen. What he says is he says, if by any means I might. That's the Apostle of the Gentiles saying that. Isn't that interesting? Look with me at Philemon 1. If you turn to Philemon 2, you've turned too far, so turn back. But that was a joke. You can, you can laugh or act like you're awake. You know, the, uh, Look with me at Philemon, and just to set the context... You all know this, but let me remind you of this. What happens is Paul is going through his travels, and in the course of his travels, he bumps into a runaway slave named Onesimus, and he bumps into him, and Onesimus gets saved. Onesimus ran away from his believing master, Philemon. And so what Paul wants to do is Onesimus can be a help to Paul in the ministry. What Paul does is rather than just say to Onesimus, well, obviously it was God's will that you run away and bump into me and get saved. God clearly planned this so that you could help me with the work. That isn't what he says at all. What happens in Philemon 1 is Paul sends Onesimus back to his master Philemon with a letter saying, Philemon, here's what happened. I bumped into Onesimus. He got saved. He's now a brother in Christ. I would like to have him travel with me and help me with the work of the ministry, but I didn't want to do that without getting your permission. So I sent Onesimus back, and you can decide now what you want to do. Now look with me at verse 15. That's what goes on that's the overall factual background behind the letter. Look what Paul says in verse 15. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever. Well, if you use the word perhaps, aren't you saying you don't know? Perhaps this is why, but perhaps not. Now think about this really carefully. What happened here 
is someone ran away, bumped in the, into the apostle of the Gentiles, and got saved. If there's anything that looks like God's will during the dispensation of grace, it would be bumping into the apostle of Gentiles and getting saved, right? Can we agree with that? What, what is God's foremost will for everyone's life on the earth today? To get saved, right? So if there's anything that looks like God's will, it would be, well, I ran away from my master and I did it for my own reasons, but I bumped into Paul and I got saved and now I'm part of the body of Christ. That looks, I mean, I'll just, at least to me, that looks an awful lot like something God would approve of. I think so. Paul doesn't say that. He doesn't look at the circumstance and say, here is how to understand what God intended in that circumstance. He doesn't say that, even though it looks like something that God would certainly approve of, because God desires all men to be saved. What Paul says is he uses the word perhaps. I'll tell you why I think that's so important. What people do all the time is they will look at some event and they will determine what God's purpose was in the event. So there's a hurricane and destroys a bunch of property and kills people. And people then go to the question of, what is God telling us? God speaks through this book. If you want to know what God is telling you, he wrote it down, and you just have to read it. But you know the problem with hurricanes? They don't speak. They just break things, right? Let me give you another example. This is just how things are. If I'm driving to work, and I get in an accident in the car, and I break my leg, and I read my horoscope, and my horoscope says, you're going to have a bad day. Well, I had a bad day because I got in a car accident and I broke my leg. But if my horoscope says, you're going to have a great day, you know what? I had a great day because I got in this very serious accident, but I wasn't killed. And my point is, events by themselves are ambiguous, and you can attach whatever meaning to them you choose to attach. If you break your leg, it can be bad news, or it can be good news. It depends really upon the meaning that you choose to attach to it. And that is the basic reason, or at least one of them, that God does not speak to you through circumstances. Circumstances are ambiguous. Some circumstances come to exist by chance. We've already seen that. And that's why what you should not do is you should not look at the events of your life or the events of the newspaper and say, here's what God is trying to communicate. God communicates through the scriptures that he specifically inspired and preserved. Look with me at Mark 11. Mark 11. Mark 11, verse 13. Mark 11, 13. And seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, and this is the Lord, by the way, if haply he might find anything thereon. In other words, it might happen that there was fruit thereon, and it might happen that there was not, because there are some things that just either happen or they, or they don't, and it's not foreordained. Get Luke 14. Luke 14. In Luke 14, this is where the Lord gives the instruction to count the cost. 
Notice verse 29. Lest haply, in other words, lest it might happen, Thank you. So we're in Luke 14, verse 29. Lest haply, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him. In other words, this is how it might happen. This is how it might turn out. Get 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And look with me at verse 4. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 4. Paul says here, Lest happily, if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we that we say not ye should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. What you can see again and again, just by the very language that Scripture uses, chance, perhaps, if, haply, not everything is foreordained. So now let me turn your attention to something else. There's actually a hymn that was written in 1774 by William Cowper, and it's called God Moves in a Mysterious Way. I believe this is the origin of, of the saying. And so I want to I want to look at the lines of this hymn and then compare them to what scripture would say. A lot of times what happens is this. Get with me Ephesians 1:9. What happens with song is that song is memorable. When when a piece of music has lyrics that align nicely with the rhythm of the song, it becomes very memorable. So I could start singing, I won't. I could start singing a whole bunch of common pop songs and everyone in the room would be able to sing along because you've heard it before, you're familiar with the music and the words line up with the music and you would just know it. Well, the same thing happens in, in church, right? There, there's, there's hymns, there's songs that we all know, and those lyrics, the meaning of those lyrics, get into our thinking, even though they may not have anything to do with the Scriptures. So here's the first stanza of God Moves in a Mysterious Way. God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. In other words, God does things mysteriously and we can't understand them is the idea. Look at Ephesians 1, verse 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. Does God act in a way mysteriously today that you can know nothing about? Or is it the truth that he's revealed the mystery? Isn't Ephesians 3 all about the fact that God revealed the mystery to Paul and that now, people should know it? Paul uses a phrase, what's the largest denomination mentioned in the Pauline Scriptures? The ignorant brethren. Right? If you, get a, if you get a concordance and you read through Paul's epistles, what he mentions repeatedly is the ignorant brethren. And he doesn't say that in a way where he's being sarcastic or nasty, but what he's saying is, God has revealed some things. Now you should know them. You follow me? Well, we should know God's will today. Now let me read this part of the hymn again. God moves in a mysterious way, and then it says, His wonders to perform. Get 1 Corinthians 1. Is God performing wonders today. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. 
But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. So let's talk about wonders just for a minute. Let's go back to Moses. When Israel was birthed in Egypt, when, when God brings the nation into existence and then brings it out of Egypt, and he's going to bring them into the promised land, God did so through signs and wonders, didn't he? When Moses went to Pharaoh, Moses said, how are they going to believe me? And God said, I'm going to give you some signs. He could put his hand in his, in his vest, I can, or cloak, I can't remember what the word there. And it comes out and it would be leprous, right? He, when, what did God do with Moses' staff? Moses threw down his staff, become a serpent, right? And then there's all the plagues that occur upon Egypt. Are those signs? Those are clearly signs, right? When Israel is wandering in the wilderness, how do they know which direction to wander? Because there's a pillar of smoke and a pillar of fire, right? There's all sorts of signs throughout the Old Testament. But what 1 Corinthians 1, 22 and 23 tells you is that you don't live in the times of the signs. Paul doesn't say that we manifest signs that you should believe. He says we preach Christ crucified. Let's go to verse 2 of the hymn. Deep in unfathomable minds of never-failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Now, you can decide this for yourself. I'll just tell you my opinion. One of the most commonly used words today in Christian circles refers to God's sovereignty. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to digress for a minute. We're going to do a full, exhaustive study in the scriptures of the word sovereignty. Now we're done. <laughs> it's not a Bible word. It is fascinating that that word gets repeated endlessly and it's not a Bible word. And the idea of it, of God's sovereignty, is God orchestrates everything to accomplish what he wants. Now listen, God is all-powerful. He's omnipotent. I'm not saying he's not. But it's wrong to say that God orchestrates things that he doesn't. And when God uses the word chance, that's his word, not mine. When he uses the word perhaps, again, that's his word, he's saying in his revealed word, not all the details of life are foreordained. They're simply not. You can decide for yourself, I don't think it makes any sense to use the word sovereignty. It's not a Bible word. And all that it does is it introduces man's false thinking into the discussion of what God himself is doing. Here's verse 3 of the hymn. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take, the clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Well, let me ask you that. Is that how life's going to work? Is God just waiting to pour out physical earthly blessings on your head? What does Ephesians 1.3 say? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. The, the simple fact of the matter is, there's no guarantee that your life will be full of earthly blessings. It's not. If you're saved, you are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, but that doesn't mean your earthly life is going to go smoothly. In fact, I mean, think about this. What does 2 Timothy 3.12 verse say? All they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall be healthy, wealthy, and wise. No, that's not what it says, is it? Shall suffer persecution. There's no guarantee that our earthly life is smooth or filled with earthly blessings. In fact, I would tell you the opposite is true. The more spiritual we are, the more likely we are to have earthly problems. But 
honestly, that's okay because earthly problems pale in comparison to the spiritual blessings. So don't sweat about it. Don't be worried about it. What I'm just encouraging you to see is some of the common sayings of Christendom are just nonsense. Here's the next verse. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. Look at me at Romans 8. Romans 8. Verse 24. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Do God's purposes unfold every hour? Or is there a blessed hope we're looking for that might be far away in time? I mean, it'll be soon in the scheme of eternity, but the rapture may not happen tomorrow, right? It hasn't happened for 1,900 plus years. Here's the last stanza, the last verse. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain, his, his creation. God is his own interpreter and he will make it plain. Let me read that one to you again. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter and he will make it plain. What that, what, that verse is, what that verse of the hymn is saying is, in scanning the events of, of earthly life, God will make it clear what's going on in those events. What's the Bible definition of faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Right? So if you're operating by faith, is what you should do... Look out at earthly events and try to understand what they mean. Well, faith is the opposite of that, isn't it? It's the substance of things hoped for in the future. It's the evidence of things not seen. You can decide for yourself. I personally think it's not the right thing to do to look at the earthly events of life and say, what is God telling me in those events? The reason why people want to do this is it's contemporary, and it's sensational, and it's interesting, and it's current. Right? And they want to understand what this event means. But this isn't what God has done. He recorded for us on the pages of Scripture, what he wants us to know. But this requires study. This requires work. And it wouldn't it be just easier if we could read the newspaper and then decide what God's hand is in all these different events. This is the sensational, easy way. This is what God's really doing. So let me read you a little bit about William Cowper. This may be interesting to you. So he was a poet, and uh, I'll just go ahead and read this to you. The leading events in the life of Cowper are he was born in his father's rectory in, in England, 1731, educated at Westminster, called to the bar 1754. In 1763, he went mad. He then uh, died subsequently in 1800. Let, let me skip along here. I'm just going to read random sentences. During this period, he fell in love with his cousin and wrote love poems to her. The marriage was forbidden by his father, but she never forgot him. Fits of melancholy from which he had suffered in school days began to increase. He attempted his life with laudanum, knife, and cord. In other words, he made three attempts at suicide. In the third attempt, nearly succeeding. Uh, 
And then a year after his brother's death, madness returned. Under the conviction that it was the command of God, he attempted suicide, and he then settled down into a belief and so on. So I'm going to skip ahead here. The words of this hymn were composed by William Cowper, 1731 to 1800. They were written in 1773, so that was after he went mad. Just before the onset of a depressive illness during which Cowper attempted suicide by drowning. Now, I tell you all that for this reason. I don't tell you all that to make fun of him or poke fun at his situation. But here's what's going on, and, and, and you do need to understand this. God works in mysterious ways is a, is, is, is a proverb that exists throughout Christendom. It's common, common, common. You've heard it before. You probably never heard who wrote it, right? But it's not a Bible term. It was written by someone who was obviously troubled, and most importantly, it's contrary to what the Bible itself says. And this, so take this as an object lesson. Here's what happens. Our minds are full of Christian slogans or Christian sayings that we've heard before and they're just commonly spoken, and we accept them. We often don't investigate them, and most importantly, we often don't verify whether there's something actually scriptural, and yet they're there in our minds, and they affect our thinking. Look at me at 1 Thessalonians 5. Get, get Acts... Uh, get Acts 17 and 1 Thessalonians 5. Acts 17. Acts 17, verse 11. Acts 17, verse 11 talks about the Bereans. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So in Acts 17, when the Bereans encounter Paul's teachings, they will receive it with readiness of mind, but then what do they do? They daily search the scriptures. Is it true or is it not? In other words, everything that they were taught, they tested, they validated against scripture itself. That's what we ought to be doing. Look with me at 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. Prove all things. The idea there is to test them, to evaluate them, whether they stand up against the test of Scripture. And then notice what it says. Hold fast that which is good. What we need to be doing in our Christian lives is we need to evaluate everything against the Word of God. Hold fast to that which is good. Discard that which is wrong. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop there, and we will pick up then during the second hour. Father, thank you for preserving your word for us. Thank you, Lord, that we do not have to rely upon man's wisdom or, or man's thinking or man's sayings, but you have preserved for us your words so that we can know the truth. We thank you for all of this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.